Hey everybody, what's up? It's Chase. Welcome to another episode of the show. You know the show. This is where I sit down with the most amazing humans and do everything I can to unpack their brains and help you live your dreams in career, in hobby, and in life. My guest today, uh, we were talking before the show, like how, what's the best way to introduce you? And what I was very uh, inspired by, his, the first word out of his mouth was a dad. So this guy is a father, uh, a husband, and one of the top photographers in the planet who focuses on action sports, outdoor, and conservation photography. Huge inspiration to me. Dear friend, please welcome to the show Mr. Chris Burkhart in the house. Thanks My man. They love you. It means the world, yeah. I'm oh. so stoked to be here. Wow, yeah. it's been so fun to watch at, I wouldn't say a distance, because we communicate, usually yeah. we're ships in the night, but right. it's been so fun to it's watch. It's a lot of like, I'm in this city, you're in this city, we, we should get breakfast, lunch, and then it's like, ah, oh, I, I took a 6 a.m. flight, you know, it's, <laughs> totally. it's a lot of that stuff. But, but it's been yeah. so fun to um, be, I guess I'll just say, be near you watching your career explode and continue to develop. And, uh, with such things like your new book, At Glacier's End. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations. Thanks, it's, uh, it is so beautiful. I just got my hands on it. Confession here, like maybe six and a half minutes ago. Yeah. It is absolutely <laughs> gorgeous. It's gorgeous. a real passion. It's real, you know, you, you know, you, you've made a, a bajillion books. Like you put your heart on a plate, you put it out there, you hope people care. And then it's kind of that if you build it, they will come scenario. Like yeah. I, I feel like that's such a, a real thing in this day and age where we're, we're in this self-publishing, self-made, self-promotion type of world where you never really know if people are gonna care. There's no guarantee and you put something out there and to see people show up and be excited and, and believe in your message, you're just, it's so empowering, so yeah. fulfilling. And it's, yeah. it's a real testament to, I think, the times that we're in that we have the ability to create something like this that's meaningful and, um, and you can actually turn a profit in some way too, which yeah. is amazing and help the environment. Well, so. I definitely want to get into some business model stuff here. My background as a photographer makes me, I know just enough about what yeah. you're doing to be able to, I think maybe you and I can turn some pages or open the kimono for some for some people in yeah, our conversation absolutely. here. Um, but to keep going down the lane of this book, so uh, I know how much work goes into these things. Stunning, stunning work. Um, it's called, again, At Glaciers, and why don't you give us the, like, the 30,000 yeah. foot on this project? <laughs> well, yeah, so as ominous as the title sounds, At like Glaciers End, this is not a book about, you know, climate change and the world coming to an end. It's actually a book about the path water takes from the glacier to the ocean, which is a really beautiful journey from the headwaters, the floodplains, all the way to basically spilling into the Atlantic and these uh, basically braided glacial streams that are in so really incredibly exciting. beautiful from the air can in many ways only be seen and appreciated from the air. So it's been a seven year journey to document um, Iceland's rivers, basically from from a small Cessna uh, with, a, with a mirrorless camera. And that body of work really over time turned from being just this really incredible, passionate, personal project to all of a sudden feeling absolutely indebted to the landscape and wanting to give something back to it after I realized that all of these rivers are threatened um, to basically aluminum smelters, um, energy export, and overfishing, not to mention um, basically extractive industries. Yeah. And so having been nice in 40 times over a decade. <laughs> um, over Long a decade, before it was cool, Chris you, Burkhardt was going yeah, there. Yeah, well, you know, you, you, Yvonne Chouinard said it best, you know, you, you spend enough time in these wild places and you feel a sense of responsibility to want to protect them. And I, I couldn't agree with that more when I realized what was at stake. My mission for photographing these turned very quickly from, I want to just share something pretty with the world that maybe I can make into a book or some prints or whatever to being like, there is a clear message to create a national park in the center of Iceland to protect all its river systems for future enjoyment of you know, our children and our children's children and, yeah. and the people of Iceland. And we worked hand in hand with the government to create this book. We had their blessing. We um, actually spoke at the environmental conference um, of the Iceland Ministry of the Environment. Um, they do it every once every two years. And I spoke at that in 2018. And that was really the turning point for me to be like, I need to do this. And that's that's why it's here. It's um, it's way outside of my realm of commercial photography or directing this and that. And it's a real, it, it to boil it down, it's a real passion project. Does that, does it feel like having, you know, 
done one of those that you want to do more because you were able to build it from the ground up according to your specs. I understand we can talk about sort of some of the the ways that you decided to the reasons behind self publishing, but just as a as a creator, did it feel fulfilling such that you want to always have one of these in your back pocket or on your radar Absolutely. or in, in process? I think and that's that's a great point, Chase is like the concept of always having something in your back pocket. I've I've re- and, and this is kind of getting more into a I guess long term business plan, which sounds very unsexy, but for me it's always this idea that you have this kind of baseline, which is what you're doing. You know, you're shooting, you know, your commercial work and the this and the that yep. and the stuff that makes you money, you know. And for me, I've kind of broken that down into different revenue streams. But there's always this back pocket plan, which is like, well, I needed to do blank on the side that's gonna keep me inspired, keep me happy, keep me excited, and also keep me sharp. Because there's an element to like when I started my career, and I I'm sure when you started yours, there was it was all fear. It was all yeah. act, it was all reacting to what was happening. And I realized very quickly that long-term projects were always the catalyst for more growth in my business. For always. Sure. For sure. Because the thing is, is like every every sort of rise and fall within my career over over these last 10, 12, 13 years, whatever, have been kind of based upon doing projects like this, books or films. And what happens is usually it's a it's, it's such a funny kind of analogy, but there's almost like a, a year of plenty followed by sort of a year of-, of <laughs> Not so plenty. Not so plenty. And, <laughs> and in those years of yeah. not so plenty, I'm, on, I'm often working on something like this. Like for example, my film, um, I'll, I'll give you the kind of the quick analysis. This, I, no, this I think is, the viewers yeah. would appreciate this, but like, you know, I, I was working uh, for magazines, shooting all these Arctic surf stuff, and I, I did a trip to Norway uh, with a with a team from uh, Smug Mug. They wanted to make a film about me shooting in the Arctic, and I was like, "This isn't going to pay anything. It's not going to make me any money. Why should I go do this? This is like, you know, I had I had a kid on the way. I'm like, I can't. A I lot can't of weeks be, of commitment. I, I can't yeah. just be wasting time to go make some video that's going to go on the internet, and you know, and, and obviously." I understood that there was value there and I was like, okay, well, is this gonna benefit my career? And so I did it, came back, that went online, you know, was really successful. It was called Arctic Swell and it had millions of views. Because of that, somebody from TED reached out and I was asked to give a TED talk. Because of that, I got all this other commercial work. Because of that, I, you know, so all I'm saying is that in these years where I've invested more time and energy into stuff like this, yeah. where I've had to turn down work, I've had to miss this you know, conference, I've had to miss this event, I've had to miss this whatever, it's benefited me greatly. And I've always urged the younger um, up and coming photographers to be like, don't be afraid of these projects. Like this is, this stuff that's long lasting, that's tangible, it's gonna be far times greater in the long term than that you know, high paying tech job that you could have shot or that automotive thing or, or whatever it is like, this is crucial to the career. So I'm always looking at two years from now. For me, it's usually on a two-year scale. Like, what's the next yeah. thing? And in 2021, as I was saying before, I have I, I have a contract with Abrams to write um, to write a memoir that's more about that critical time in my life, shooting a lot of surfing in the Arctic, and and sort of what I learned from that, and dealing with family and life and growth and all those things. So there's always that little you know, that sort of long-term goal. I guess yeah. your eyes are set on two different things. One's right, what's right in front of you and one's like what's down the line. And I think it's really beneficial. It's so hard to coach that too until you've actually yeah. experienced it. Like mm-hmm. I think that's part of uh, the same exact thing is true for me. Like the more commercial work, commercial work begets commercial work. But that to me is like a baseline of operations. And we ran a very profitable photo studio that allowed us to invest in you know, things like yeah. self-published books and developing apps, even like Creative Live was largely born out of having a lot of equipment, some experience, right. some free well, time and, baby, some, yeah, right? and a little yeah, money. You're like, maybe we can help people learn this mm-hmm. stuff on the internet. And so whether it's a book or, a, you know, just this, that, that second focal length that you're mm-hmm. talking about, yeah. I think that's, you know, I've had a lot of photographers on the show and no one's ever really talked as concretely as you just did about that. And I think it can't be overstated how important it is. Right, and I think it's a fear-based thing where when you're starting out, there's so much fear. I mean, I, yeah. I, I remember the day vividly going from like being on contract for magazines 
um, and, and be on staff to being like, now I'm full freelance and I'm still full freelance today. There's no check coming in next week right. from so-and-so that's just, it's, it's always that work, it's perspective and you hope it comes. And again, if you build it, they will come sort of scenario. And so I feel like these projects, be it books, be it films, be it small pieces we're putting online, um, you know, submitting to film festivals, whatever. Those are, those are my, those are my ad campaigns. Yeah. Those are the, those banners that I put in the ground that say, "Hey, remember me." And luckily, it's been beneficial, and I think that the right people have seen it, and it keeps us busy throughout the whole year. But again, again, when I made Unarctic Sky, there was a year following that this film where I toured the thing all over the world, and I had to turn down so much work. And I don't know about you, but coming from a blue collar family where Same. like the one thing my mom and dad never taught me was to turn down work. They never teach you how to say no. <laughs> right. They teach you how to say yes to everything because yeah. saying no would be like, it would it, it would be asinine. It'd be like, yeah. it, you couldn't fathom it. So I grew up in this methodology where it was like, you say yes to everything and it's made me a, a self-professed workaholic. And so it's really been the last four years that I've yeah. learned to start saying no and I think a big portion of that is like listening to a lot of your advice, listening to, I, I would say, people who have been down the road a bit more and, and are real, and I'm, I'm realizing now, you know, basically that um, saying no is saying yes to what you want, yeah. you know, and you're saying yes to time, which time is everything, right? It's so true, and to focus, because that, that's the flip side, and I noticed the same thing, when you are saying yes because of the fear base, like I don't I don't know where my next meal is gonna come from, and I think we're painting a little bit like, you know, you, you as a freelancer, you're always putting money in the bank for the rainy day, and whether right. that rainy day comes or not, right. there's that fear that that uh, is certainly a part of all the your your thoughts. Yeah. But it's just yeah. suppressed now more. That's yeah. all. It's it's still there <laughs> for 100%. sure, for sure. And you get a little bit better of dealing with it. Um, but I couldn't agree more with the 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 best stuff comes from differentiating yourself. And how do you differentiate yourself other than doing yeah. books and films that are so signature and so such a right. indelible mark on something that you and only you could have this point of view. This is a beautiful piece of work. Thank you so much. And and I think to, to kind of speak on a more, I would say, focused aspect as to how it benefits people, because I, I, I know it does, it just sounds like, you know, yeah, take risks and blah, blah, blah. And, yeah. <laughs> no, we're, and, and people are like, I literally like am going to be going to shoot senior portraits this weekend because I need to make money. Yeah. I've been there, I've yeah. done that. And yeah. so I, I know that struggle and I lived in my car below poverty level for a, a long enough time to realize like the real <laughs> reality. But I think the benefit of these projects, if I could speak on a more focused aspect is that the goal should always be to get your work in front of a new audience. And that is truly what it's about because yeah. Again, it's, it's like social media. You know, you're sharing the same things to the same group of people. What's the point? Yep. When I made um, my children's book two years ago, um, which was this awesome project, we worked with a, a small publisher out of Salt Lake City, and it was their idea. They came to me, and I was like, I had always wanted to do a children's book. I have two kids. Um, that, again, it was this tool that was a personal project wrapped up with, you know, time and energy and commitment and everything. But when it released, it was on you know, mommy blogs and all of these stores and in, in Patagonia and in national park stores, all of my other books never saw the success that that did. None of my other books got me to where that did audience wise in, in terms of being yeah. in front of a new group of people. And I, I think you contribute the same success as like all of a sudden you, you realize that it's not about doing the same thing over and over. It's about like, how can this next project get me in front of a new audience so that the, the Chris Burkhardt brand or the Chase Jarvis brand or the Creative Live brand is all of a sudden, you know, cared about by a whole new group of people. And I think with Creative Live specifically, that's I think a big part of your guys' plan is like, you know, really started out with like photographers helping photographers, but now you go on there and there's like, you know, typography classes and there's like, you know, might as well be cooking shows yeah. and everything you can imagine. Yeah. We have wine classes. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and that's so cool, you yeah. know, to, to feed all those people's needs, you know. Yeah. I think that is very hard. I said this a second ago. I'm going to re-say it here. It's very hard to overstate all of those peripheral projects that you don't actually know the outcome. And anytime you you sort of profess to know the outcome, like it probably is the wrong thing. It's this: what is you don't know quite what's possible. What new right. audience your work's going to get in front of? Um, 
And to be able to walk and chew gum or juggle different balls with different hands, one is this, you know, the path where you know you have uh, the next job and the next job and the next job, whether that's commercial photography yeah. or, or otherwise, just it's hard to overstate it. Um, so I, I love that opening salvo for our conversation, <laughs> but I wanna take that now and say, you mentioned several times like living in your car below poverty level, you've got a family, there's fear. Yeah. So let's- Those let's... were all at the same time, luckily. <laughs> <clears throat> right. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, that's how diamonds are made though, right? Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of pressure. Um, but let's go back there, because I think a lot of, um, you mentioned how action, how sort of doing these projects has moved your career forward. And I think there's a lot of, um, when I get asked like, how, how do I do this or how do I do that? Most of it's rooted in action and playing through fear. And most of the people that I feel like have, there's a gap between where they are and where they wanna be. They're either, mm -hmm. they don't know that you have to be afraid and do hard things. Yeah. Um, so take me back to- uh, early I know, days? Yeah, the early days when you, yeah. you went from A, not being a photographer to identifing as a photographer and then step yeah. B, the, that part where you left being a staff photographer and went freelance. Yeah. So give me those two different windows. I, I will, I'll just, I'll just um, book in that first with kind of a one thought, which I really love what you mentioned about people wanting this, this advice on where to go. And what I always find is that, and this is, I usually tell the same thing to everybody, is I'm like, I could draw you a beautiful roadmap if you had an ending point, but you don't. And when you don't know where you wanna end up, it's impossible to give someone directions. And I, I kind of pride myself on being able to give good advice and being able to give good criticism and being able to help people weave through challenging narratives um, that whether they've made for themselves, the world has or whatever. But, it, but it's so hard when people, they want you to kind of tell them where to end up. And I'm like, that's for you to decide. That's the introspective part. And I think for me, I sort of made that decision fairly early on. I was. Um, 19 years old, I quit my job, I quit school. I was working at a magazine store in Pismo Beach, California. Um, every single day I would sit at the magazine store and I would stare at the ocean because it was right out the window and I would sell magazines. And the goal, honest to God, was that in some capacity by being close to all of these beautiful travel magazines that were off here to my left, the nudie magazines were back here to my, my, my right over here. Um, <laughs> that I could, I had this like eye shot of like, you know, afar and, you know, Nat Geo Traveler. And I would outside and I, I'd somehow get closer to being there. And I realized that all that job did was drove me absolutely insane. And I was shooting a lot in, uh, in uh, at the end of high school, college. Um, I was taking a uh, black and white photography film class. So again, college, junior college. I only went to college mainly because. I wanted to make my mom happy. Um, I was Such a, a consistent answer. Yeah, you know, I mean, we were byproducts of, yeah, we're, we're social animals. Yeah, yeah we wanna animals. make people happy. I was the only person in my family at the time who had the opportunity, potential scholarships to go and basically have a college degree. Yeah. And so, and I think because we were lower income housing and I, I have, um, you know, quite a bit, a bit of Hispanic and Native American, I, I, had, I had a lot of, uh, I had good financial aid options. And, and benefits there. So, um, <laughs> worst piece of advice ever. I took all that money and I basically spent it on everything I could except school. Um, <laughs> and I, I took the minimum, minimum amount of credits to basically acquire that financial aid. Um, and at a certain point I realized like this is just, it wasn't that it was dishonest, it just wasn't, I wasn't fulfilling my potential yeah. in this school realm. But again, like there was no creative life. There was no internship opportunities. What I wanted to shoot in photography, which was I, I dreamt of being a landscape photographer, um, and I, I loved action sports, because that's kind of what I grew up doing, is I grew up surfing, right? Um, there was nowhere that was gonna teach me that. Brooks was an hour and a half south. And, and 50 grand a year. And 50 grand a year, and it was, at the time, still reputable. Luckily, the San Francisco Art Institute was even more, and it was like, what was I gonna learn? Like, I didn't wanna know how to do portrait photography or studio photography, I wanted to, I wanted to emulate, you know, Michael Fatali or Ansel Adams or, um, or you know, these surf photographers that I idolized, you know, flipping through the magazines. And um, I realized at that time, I was like, what's gonna happen is, I've always kind of had this visualization that all of us at different stages of our life are standing at the train station. And 
basically what happens is the train is coming to you and it slows down for just a second and you have an opportunity to get on. But if you don't, you're kind of like, well, I can catch up to it if I just start running. And I think what ends up happening is that most of the time we don't jump on when it slows down and you start chasing after it and you're always chasing after it. And I've, I've felt that multiple times in my life, whether it's opening a new studio and taking that leap. It's always a leap. Like you're not yeah. quite ready. Your bags aren't totally packed and you might have to jump on the train with, with not everything with right, you. Your you're, toothbrush you're, is still. <laughs> your shit's not together. But, yeah. but again, it's, it's like I, at that moment, I was like, I'm gonna give it five years and I'm gonna give everything I have to photography. And there was no hope of being like, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm an adventure photographer now. This was like literally getting up, going to shoot a senior picture, um, going to shoot a wedding, going, I mean, I, I've told this story too. I was asked to shoot a midget rodeo. I would have done it. I didn't yeah. have to do that, but I would have shot anything that was offered to me to make a living. And so those were five to six years of absolute, um, you know, living with passion. Passion, I think, requires sacrifice. That's a part of what passion means. And, um, and so, yeah, I lived in my car large period of time. I was, I interned at Transworld Surf. I would drive to Oceanside. Yeah, it's not an Oceanside or Encinitas. Or exactly. Or, I mean, yeah, because you shot for Transworld Snow yeah, yeah, for a yeah. period of time. Yeah. yeah. That office, you know, it was kind of cool. Yeah. And first time going to a creative studio and being like, this is rad. Mm -hmm. I would leave my, my parents' house at 3 a.m. on Monday, drive down there, live in my car for the week, come back. And I did that for four months. Um, and I just basically, after that, kind of realized that life on the road was, was where I was going to be the most effective, and so I kind of moved into that little Toyota Tacoma, and uh, and that was sort of the the impetus of the career path. And and there and the, the funny thing is, and I'm sure you get this so much, Chase is like, where when did it all change? When did it all get better? And you're like, well, I'm an overnight success. It just took 13 years, yeah. you know. And so there was not a single like there wasn't a single quintessential moment where things shifted. It was like a thousand little ones. Yeah, it was a thousand small decisions. And I think a big portion of that was, was that I absolutely did not take the fastest path to success. I just took the path that I think taught me the most lessons, made the most lasting impression. And I think that, um, you know, there's a really beautiful analogy of these four burners. And I think you probably know about this, but like, you know, if you have four burners and one of them's health and one of them's family and one of them is friendship and one of them is, um, you know, work, yep. basically, what's gonna happen is if you wanna be successful, you have to turn one of those off. And if you wanna be really successful, you have to turn two of those off. And that's pretty bleak. Like, yeah. so basically I turned off the friendship burner and I turned off the health burner because health wasn't really important to me, you know? I was yeah. living in my car and eating, you know, scrounging up 50 cents to buy Del Taco or something like that. <laughs> gummy um, bears. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> eating copious amounts of gummy bears. It was like, Feast or famine sort yeah. of thing. And then friendship, like I, I started my career young. I kind of totally disconnected from every group of friends I have just now, I would say in the last four to five years, am I learning how to be a better friend? And I'm only saying all this stuff because I want people to understand that there are real sacrifices that are made. And that was like a very, very challenging aspect of my life that like it's lonely out yeah. there on the road. Crazy lonely. No yeah. one to call because you've basically burnt all your relationships, nobody to rely on. I just had my girlfriend and sort of my my family who was busy raising other kids and um, and work, you know. And uh, so that's, that was the but, that was the impetus. But that's that. su but it's such a heartfelt and honest answer. I, I don't know anyone who's achieved I would call world class level success without that trade off. And there's oh, yeah. this, these you know I hear all I think I have a blog post something like it's like work-life balance like I don't I don't understand it and yeah I think there can be harmony it's like yes. at some point this like your home life is ringing and your work life is ringing but these other two are largely dead in the right. water I, I, I couldn't agree more so if we you clearly said all of that stuff in a way that is oriented around your background and your passion yeah, yeah. but there's a prescription there Mm -hmm. I think if we, if I'm listening to the show or watching it, and for those people at home, most of whom are somewhere like they've they've put their toe in the water, mm -hmm. awesome. but they haven't really committed. What's your what's your advice? Um, man, 
I look back on those times and they were hard. Like I look back on, um, I mean, the reality is that there is no amount of, there's no amount of suffering, I think, in it for something you love um, that in the end isn't gonna be worth it, at least for me. Like, I, I've always felt like I could block out all of the, you know, terrible night sleeps and all the food and all the blah, blah, blah and all the, the disappointments when I knew I was pursuing a path that truly intrinsically felt um, like this was, like I was following what, whatever you want to call it, you know, your, your North Star, your, you know, if you want to get voodoo here and call it your, your energetic center or whatever yeah. it is. Like, and and I, I just, there was something so right about that despite everybody else telling me that it was wrong. Yeah. You know, parents being one of them and doubts from relationships and this and that and, and even editors I had worked with and stuff. But um, the joy that it gave me was incredible. And I think that first and foremost, I would not jump into a career like this or any creative career because, because money is the first thing. Yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you what, that was a hard lesson to learn was the fact that um, I'll be totally honest, you know, I got into this career because I wanted to get out of my small town. I wanted to get out of the six o'clock news and the dinner table conversations. I didn't have a passport until I was 20. Um, I didn't travel, I never left the US at all. Um, just wasn't in the cards for us income wise. And my mom made a lot of sacrifices for me when she was young. And I'm only gonna tell you this because I, I want it to be super clear that you need a driving force bigger than collecting a paycheck and collecting stamps in your passport if you wanna do this long term. For five years, yeah, you can get by with that. You can be happy for sure. 10 years even. But there'll be a point somewhere along the lines where you're gonna realize this career path or, or whatever this is, is not gonna be worth this sacrifice if I'm not truly fulfilling myself, feeling like I'm truly giving of myself. And for me, what that North Star was, was that my mom, we, I grew up in a single parent home, it was me and my mom. She had me when she was 17. Um, everything that I've done career-wise was to share those experiences with her because she never traveled, she never went anywhere. And, um, and that was, that still is the greatest gift that I could offer. And when I would come back from trips, it would be like I'd come back and I'd share these experiences with her. And then I'd come back and I'd share it with this kind of immediate group of friends doing slideshows or whatever for my surf community. Yeah. Nowadays, I share that with millions of people and it's a real joy and it's the same thing. It's the, the same, same process. Reason. Right? It's the same thing. It's just, it's just change, you know, but I do it with my yeah. thumbs now instead of clicking on slides. Um, but what I'm getting at here is that if you don't find that, if you can't boil down why you do what you do into a mission statement that feels true and honest, I, I just don't see it lasting. Yeah. Or you'll end up being jaded and you'll do this as a career path and you'll never excel above that you know, like, oh, I got, I, I became this and this became safe because the crazy thing about this career or any creative career, and, and you can testify to this, I've heard you speak on this uh, just about your last book too, um, is the fact that like, it can become mundane, like anything can, yeah. it doesn't matter. Like my level of risk and what I'm capable of and what I'm comfortable with is obviously way higher than the average person. But the reality is for me, I have to push myself into different capacities to feel like I'm growing yeah. and this is why public speaking is a huge part of that because it terrifies me. This is why making books on an environmental issue that terrifies me because I'm really, you know, never consider myself an environmentalist. This is why I made a children's book, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. And that, that is critical, you know? It's not just like I'm doing a creative career path. Now all of a sudden I'm, I'm on this trajectory of self-growth and awareness and everything, you know? So, it's, it's, only, it's a long-winded answer, I'm sorry. No, yeah. that's the best, that's why we're yeah. here. Okay, like, don't cool. never just, apologize for this. If yeah. we're on TV, uh, they cut you off. Yeah, this is like, like, cut I'm, your commercial break. I, I, this is pure, pure gold. You talked about the, the North Star, that's like literally why I wrote the book, Creative Calling, because that- Oh, the book is amazing, well, yeah. that, Whether that is a, um, the creative part, it's actually the, the calling and the creative part are actually a little bit separate. I put them together in a nice spicy little well, I love that book, how the very beginning, like you, you, you know, a good talk, a good book, whatever, it needs a thesis and it needs to cut straight to the point. Like that book, like right when you open up 
in the first thing, you're like, okay, I get it. Like, this is rad. Yeah, like, you're it, two pages in and you know. Yeah, it, it's just like, and it's, it's, it's easy reading in the best kind of way because you can digest it yeah. and it's actionable. And I think that there's just too much in the world nowadays that's not actionable. I mean, I think most of the big political and environmental issues we deal with, people just, they, they just want to shout. And you're not hearing a lot of um, like things you can do that are really, you can put into practice and that's important. Yeah, well, thanks for that. But that, that to, like what your focus on your North Star to me is is everything, and and if you don't have that, when the way I say it is when shit gets hard, mm-hmm. and it will, there's not a career, not a a career path, not a line of work where shit doesn't get hard. Doesn't matter how much you like it or how right. good you are, and it's only that gut check, like, am I doing this for the right reasons that yeah. will get you through that? I mean, are you one of those people that like when it's not hard, you kind of make it hard? <laughs> oh, for sure. I, if this is. I'm the worst. I, you know, talk about your <laughs> your um, like all those ways that you wanted to put yourself out there with speaking and doing books. Yeah. And I, there was a time where you said also that anything could be mundane. And I remember I was on a shoot when we had we had I think 99 crew members and four helicopters. Dude, yeah, right. In you know, and it was 30 days of shooting in New Zealand yeah, with and, that setup. And it, that literally, if that was the first day you ever picked up a camera, like in the beginning, it was like, this is the dream. This There's is, nothing better. Yeah, there literally is, this is apex, <laughs> and can yeah. never get better. And I literally remember gut checking, and this is something, maybe I'm confessing in a, a, some stuff I've never confessed before, which is like, when I was like, man, I really hope that we can fit, wrap this up, because, you know, and, and was like, not not grateful, right? but, to the point that anything can be mundane, and that was in this an era where I was, you know, launched launched the photo app and Creative Live, and I right. just knew that I wanted to expand the footprint of what was possible for me. So, in in both the sense of like keeping a North Star, but also making it complex for yourself. Right. Then I started like, okay, great. How can we shoot the ad? And I've seen this: you, you shoot the campaign, you direct the commercial, yeah, right, right. you're actually talent. Also, yeah. there's you know, like literally, you're in the it's uh, full circle. Yeah, you're in front of the camera. It's yeah. like when we think about making things complicated, and I see other people, my peers, like yourself, do that. I'm like, I know that part yeah. of the career right there. Boy, you want to make it as complex as possible. And I'm a big fan of just the the folks who are deep and interesting and have the you know the polymaths and they have like the, the multifaceted skill sets and I I think that's a big portion of why I've, I've looked up to you and I've, I've love the fact that you're now doing a podcast because yeah. obviously communicating is a great talent of yours and I think it's again for myself it's like a, I, I, I force myself into these situations where I'm like what is if, if this is no longer serving me you know if this certain type of you know creative outlet is no longer serving me. What what would be challenging me and helping me grow and whatnot? And I I I, I reach for that, you know. Um, it's it's again it's like the public speaking thing. It's, it's the writing thing. It's the making books. Um, writing a memoir now is like it's the biggest joke in my household because I'm like, I tell my wife and my publicist and everything. I'm like I don't want to write a memoir. And they're like I'm like I don't want to write a memoir at all. I have no desire. And they're like, oh, Chris, it's not a biography. It's about a moment in life that was important to you. And I've had to come to the terms that the fact that I don't want to do it is the reason I need to do it. Because yeah. if it can benefit one young kid who felt or can relate to my experience as a youth feeling the, you know, the need to validate and the need to, to have self-worth and dealing with self-worth issues, yeah. then, then this is beneficial. And it's, it's a crazy thing. And, I, and I, I just, I really empower people to do that. Like I don't even call myself a photographer because I think that being a storyteller is all I really hope to do, yeah. and whatever skill set I need to do that is the one I want to pick up. So, yeah. it's so beautiful, so well put, and I couldn't agree more. It's I'm doing the same thing. I'm writing. I probably wrote 150,000 words for nice. a, for a 75,000 word book because <laughs> yeah. not good, not fast. You know, yeah. slow, hard, excruciatingly painful, but I wouldn't have. You know, traded it for the world. Mm-hmm. I want to um, circle back on something you just talked about with identity. Mm-hmm. I think so much of um, our either opportunity or our limiting beliefs are tied to our identity, what we see as possible for yeah. ourselves. Yeah. And so take me through your journey. I think I got a hint there that there was some self-doubt at, at, at some point yeah. and some, some heritage stuff. And 
part of you know telling stories and having conversations in front of the cameras and whatnot here is about helping people understand that they're not alone. That I think when we watch Instagram right. lifestyle or right, right. see you on outside TV or pick up your book, that everything is easy and, and always has been. Yeah, I mean, tell us differently. Early, yeah, and I and I, it's a hard one because I I never really want to be that person. Like, let me. You know, sing you my sad story. Yeah, tell you, you know? how hard I but, had it. Yeah. But I, because I think like everybody has it hard in different ways, and I, I think in this day and age, it's you never know a person, you know, truly until you you chat with them. But I, I do love the fact that I feel like, given the situation that I was, I grew up in, and or um, the challenges or struggles I had, I feel pretty strongly that that if if I can do it, many people can do it. You know, and um, and I wasn't born into an ideal scenario to do this. Again, um, mom had me when she was uh, 17 years old. My biological father passed away before I was born while she was pregnant. Um, she had the very, 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 very real option to forego that pregnancy, mm-hmm. but she didn't. So I've spent a large portion of my adult life, of my teenage life, and my youth feeling issues of self-worth because I wanted to um, I wanted to make sure that I lived up to those expectations. I mean, that's just yeah. straight out there. Yeah, that's... And the reality is, you know, it's hard because it required sacrifice on her end. You know, it's not fun to go to high school being pregnant. It's not fun to miss these, you know, these awesome, epic, you know, life-changing experiences, you know, as a youth going to dances and this and that because you're giving birth. So... Um, I think the greatest accolade <laughs> I could ever give myself in my career was that I was able to take my mom to Iceland um, last year, her first trip out of the country. It was, by all means, a beautiful experience to be able to share a place that means so much to me with her, mm-hmm. a place that I love, and just to see her be a kid again was amazing. And she's childlike in many ways because she, she kind of had to grow up real fast and yeah. um, you know she's since married and I have an amazing stepdad and he's a rock and super solid and whatnot but um, there were some really real hard times I mean it was uh, it was bare bones for a lot of time and I think that um, <clears throat> that has been my you know beyond like the oh yeah I, you know lived in my car and it was hard and I, I struggled for this career path I mean it's funny because you know just like we talk about alpine climbing or you know ski mountaineering or or whatever it is like these are things you know you get yourself into a shitty situation or it's cold or it's hard you're there on purpose you're there because you want to be you chose to be there (laughs) just remember this is elective suffering nobody forced you to go to the top of everest nobody ever held a gun to your head and like you have to go okay so the fact that it's hard is irrelevant to me in that in those regards the fact that my career in the beginning was hard is kind of irrelevant i chose that i literally quit my job and quit school being like, I'm gonna be uneducated. You know? <laughs> um, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna be like- poor. I'm gonna be poor as hell. Um, for a long time. <laughs> for a long time, yeah. <laughs> but the, but the, the real deep-rooted issue to me was more of the self-worth, the validation, um, how you receive that, where it comes from, and, and what you do with it to interpret it in a healthy way. You know, and um, that's, I think, the real kind of root of, I think, my um, my desire to to work hard yeah. and efficiently and fast and maybe sometimes a little too much so and maybe not smell the flowers as much. But um, it's been a, it just again, in the last couple of years, have I been able to kind of come to terms with this full circle reality that um, that I can't live with that guilt and guilt is a terrible thing and guilt um, is not, healthy in any capacity and I think a lot of us carry it for yep. some reason or the other whether you know I, I you know I know you're on Rich Roll's podcast he's a he's someone who I, I really look up to and I've always yeah. loved the way he's talked about you know alcoholism and his whole issues and I'm just I, I love that honesty you yeah. know whatever it is whatever we get into whether it's early in life or later in life that's something that stacks up and it 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 changes the way we decide make decisions in life and the way we treat people and so that's been I think my Real Achilles Hill, and really one of the things that I've tried to empower others to move beyond. Yeah, and you've done such a nice job of that in, in yeah. your teaching. Sorry, those are hard things to kind of like. No, that down. that is like, yeah. and there's an element of your Creative Live class 
where you talk about the same journey and doing things that matter to you. That's a way of developing uh, a relationship with yourself yeah. and honesty and authenticity and integrity. And um, is there a time when you felt, you know, go back to your statement, there was no time where you, um, you know, there was no break lucky break it was a thousand a thousand yeah, small breaks there were and that's the thing is there were <clears throat> there were blips yeah. you know along the way um again uh publishing my first book at 22 with california surf project it was a i i, I won a grant f to, f at, for the best upcoming surf photographer through a magazine surfing magazine yada 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 long story short i took all that money and instead of buying camera gear and um but you know paying for some parking tickets, putting, you know, <laughs> my tires had metal coming through. Uh -huh. That would've been great. Or anything else like that. Um, uh, again, I took that money, it was five grand, and I put every single dollar of that into doing another project, into doing this road trip of California, north to south, that um, was hopefully gonna be in a book. But we weren't talking to publishers. I had never spoken to a publisher. I didn't even know what a publisher was. I had no clue. I was, I was literally 21 years old. And so, I spent all that money on that trip. And I think the main part of it was, I think that a, a big part of my personal story is I've, I, you know, the self-worth thing, but also sort of wanting validation from my peers. Mm -hmm. And when I won this grant, it was honor of Larry Flame. He was the old editor at Surfing Magazine. Um, a portion of that was like, yeah, you get the money based upon your portfolio, your images, but we want you to write what you want to do with it. And so I wrote, this is what I wanted to do. And it was challenging not just to be like, oh, I just need to, I want to use this check for so many things, but I felt indebted to them to honor them yeah. and to be like, no, I'm going to do this. And so I did it. And even if it was unsuccessful, I'm going to do it. And that's what I did. And I, when we came back and we had, you know, you know, 80,000 images or whatever it was from this trip, you know, shooting with a Canon 20D at the time and two lenses, one borrowed, uh, traveling up and down, you know, the coast in a Volkswagen bus, like I said, it was absolutely the most game-changing thing in my career because it did get published. It was a good idea. It was a focused idea. As you know, with publishers, Focus. all they want is focused idea. We don't want this retrospective of your whole life and career and your thoughts and ideas. It's like, you know, give me a book that's about one thing and, I, and that's what we had and they loved it. Chronicle Books published it. And when that came out, this was the first, and, and I, it's funny because I don't really think of the blips as like, well, this was a huge success thing. It was more like I was having a little mental spark of like, well, this was successful because of this. Yep. And you when, can connect the dots. Yeah, in a I way. connected the dots. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah I, I didn't mean my my uh, my royalty for the first book was it was five percent, but I had to split that with a co-author, and so I think we we got nine thousand dollars advance on royalties that we split, and every couple years from then we've received like a thousand bucks. But again. The trip in and of itself cost more than five grand. That money went to pay for $2,000 in parking tickets. <laughs> the bus broke down, all this stuff. But when it came out, that book was in Urban Outfitters. It was in Barnes & Noble. It was at Costco for a period of time. I mean, it was everywhere. And because of a couple things, first of all, we shot it in a way, and this was, I think, the biggest, I would say, shift in my career and life and everything and really that trip, and I want to get into this more because I think you'll really appreciate and relate to this. That trip changed my life in a couple of ways. It was the first time I wasn't working under the sort of, the, the guise of an editor or somebody who was like telling me what to do or, or saying, hey, Chase, we need you to shoot the Transworld, uh, you know, Snowway, you know, or whatever. And it, was, it wasn't about feeding advertisements or feeding logos. It was about basically creating work that I knew they that was they were going to be stoked on like yeah. like the general public right yeah basically the people out there in the world who were going to read this and pick it up you or anybody right could could appreciate it because it was shot in a way that was timeless we tried to basically strip down all the logos make this a non-commercial venture um at the t which I, at the time I didn't know what commercial was or it wasn't um but when the book came out it appealed to everybody that appeal got me in front of a lot of people that's where my very first commercial stuff came from. I think it was like a, a winery wanted to license a tote bag uh, wow. for an image for a tote bag, right? Yeah. And then I got a call from like Daphne's California Greek and they wanted photos on the wall, but these weren't prints, like, you know, prints for somebody. This was like, you know, a, a POP or display for yeah. like a, for a shop. And, and my first commercial work spun off of that, which was actually shooting 
um, <laughs> a wine release for Dave Matthews because uh, he released a wine <laughs> and uh, I traveled up and down. So that's a long story, but all I'm getting at is that that was the catalyst, yeah. that book, that trip, that investment into a long-term project that was totally fearful. I had no idea what it was going to end up as. Yep. You know, this and that. That was the thing that really, I think, set my my this trajectory that, okay, investing in long-term projects is not a bad thing. It's actually really beneficial. Um, I developed a sense of style and persona, and I spent every day for 50 days waking up, going to bed with my camera, and that 10,000 hours thing, and you've talked about that too, like yeah. the 10,000 hours rule is real. Like yeah. I had spent my first 10,000 hours. I was with the camera, I was shooting as much as I could. And I wrote an article years ago on, and I would love to get your interpretation Ooh, on this. Yeah. I wrote an article years ago about the importance of a road trip in a photographer's journey or a creative's journey. Corey Rich, you know Corey, oh, yeah. um, Jimmy Chin, yep. Ernan Ozturk, Tim Kempel, myself, even Ansel Adams. I, I did the research and I talked to all these people and, I, and basically every single one of our careers was drastically changed, morphed, created, what have you, from a road trip. From And, 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 and a road trip is just one way of putting it. From a in-depth, long shooting experience where there wasn't the distractions, home, of life, or girlfriends, or this and that. Yep. And I've often told people, like, if you want to find your style, it's simple. Wake up every single day with the camera, go to sleep with the thing, shoot sunrise, shoot sunset. You, you, it can't be something that's just there and you're gonna pick it up on a Monday casually and pick it up on a Thursday and there has to be an investment of time. It's yeah. a muscle and if you flex it, it comes stronger. And, and I would just love to know what-, what That is exactly, oh, I, I yeah, talked about- Yeah, tell me, what was your no, My, uh, there was a handful and they all had that same rhythm, whether it's a road trip or just a, a commitment to make a body of work. Right, right. My first, I remember my first portfolio involved driving from uh, Steamboat Springs where I was living at the time up to British Columbia, down yeah. the West Coast, out to Death Valley, and you know, over the course of so you're maybe, like on the Powder Highway kind yeah, of, and then coming back for That's sure. Cool. Yeah, and, and shot everything from landscapes in Death Valley to surfing Rad. at Huntington to mountain biking up in um, in BC on one trip with the goal of making a portfolio. Rad. And it, uh, I feel like that the focus and the depth of I think you said it best with investment. Mm -hmm. Like you don't, you know, you can't start reaping rewards without planting seeds, right? No, yeah. And this seed planting, it's sort of like the universe is saying, okay, show me this level of commitment. And you, I have seen in my own career and with others, be curious to see what, if, if you had any of this, where <laughs> you get these little, like you get an opportunity while you're sitting at home, so to speak. Yeah. And it might be a campaign or a gig or a, a POP or a mm -hmm. license deal or whatever, mm -hmm. but that's not, that doesn't sustain you. And you have a little, there's a little high, there's a little buzz, yeah. like yeah, someone yeah. like my work. A little, yeah. But <laughs> there, but it's not real until there's this massive investment on the side of the creator. No. It's almost like declaring you your intention. You, yeah, you wouldn't feel that connection to it. You wouldn't, yeah. there, there'd be no risk, right? So risk is a, obviously a, a buzzword these days and it's a good one. I love it. I think that when it comes to investing into a portfolio, that's one of my favorite things to tell people yeah. because this concept that you're just gonna sit there and put good energy out into the world and think real hard and that somebody's gonna come to you and be like, you know what, I, I have a feeling that you would be interested in shooting an automotive campaign. You've never done it, never seen any work from you, but I think you're gonna be good at this. Said no one ever. Said no one ever. And I, <laughs> and I use this comp in my workshops yeah. that I've taught in the past. I, I've come across this a lot. And we always have this funny analogy where like, um, and, I'm, and this is, there's nothing wrong with either of these career paths, but it's always this constant, um, this constant question of like, I'm a wedding photographer, but I really wanna shoot motocross. And I, I use those analogies because they're polar opposite. And I think it's always funny because oftentimes that's kind of what it is. Like yeah. I was literally shooting senior pictures. I wanted to be out shooting surfing. Um, same thing, right? So how do you get from one to the other? And, and here is the terrifying thing is that when you have to tell someone, and I'm sure you've done this, you're like, hey, you know that, um, 
consistency and that income and that steady flow in the bank account and all these niceties that you've become accustomed to from shooting this thing and doing it really well, but now you're unfulfilled, yeah, you're gonna have to backtrack and go back to that place where you're scraping pennies off the floor of your car and yep. whatever. The reality is, is that unless you invest in these portfolios you wanna create. Yep. For me, it started with automotive. I was going to Iceland shooting surf trips for magazines. Um, that was it, you know, making kind of pennies on the dollar, editorial. You, yeah, rough. you know, it's more glamorous than it looks, trust for me. Sure. As you, a, look, you see your page, the two page spread in a magazine, you realize, I got like 800 bucks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you're lucky, or you're yeah. like, oh, great. Yeah, like a trans world. You're like, right. oh, this is like $300. <laughs> yeah, um, and you slept in your car for two weeks yeah, to get exactly. it. Exactly. Right? Three months later, get paid 90 days after the day. Um, anyway, if you don't invest in those portfolios, they will never come. For me, it was on a, on these surf trips to Iceland where I was, I remember uh, 2006, I'm driving around in a minivan. It was the most affordable thing we could get at the time. And I'm seeing all these awesome, just, you know, Land Rover Defenders and Jeeps and, and Land Cruisers driving around and this beautiful landscape. And I was like, I, I was like, I have so much downtime. I wanna be shooting that stuff. Yeah. But they were like six grand to yeah. rent for the week, yeah. right? Back in the day when the economy <laughs> hadn't collapsed. And I realized, I was like, screw it. And the next trip I went there, I was like, I spent the money every waking second that we weren't chasing waves or being at the beach or whatever. I was shooting that, I was shooting these cars. I was yeah. driving around, put it in this spot, and I was doing so to create a portfolio that I could then put in front of an automotive client if one ever reached out, heaven forbid, that'd be amazing, right? But that I was proud of. Yeah. And this being proud of something is so critical. It's not even just a matter of investing. It's a matter of investing to the point where you feel proud of it yeah. and you feel confident. And I think with aerial photography, same thing. Like I've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in aerial photography. This book will never make up for that yeah, investment. Never, no chance. But yep. in the last three years, I finally started to get hired to shoot jobs. And I, I, I did a really cool one for a couple different brands over the last couple months even that were focused on purely that. And I was like, wow, yeah. what a what an amazing thing to see and reap the benefits of that. So that investment is critical. And, and it is, it's it's actual money. Yeah. It's, it's actual income. Money and money and time. Yeah. It's yeah. not like we're not saying that word like in a fake way. Like this yeah. is, you know, in like Bitcoin things. <laughs> so <laughs> this is this is real, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, so it is that investment. And and some of it's just again, it's it's time. It's it's and what it is, it's time away from things that could be making you money, Yeah, which is scary. There's an opportunity cost there that's yeah. massive. Yeah, totally. I love that. And I think I may have actually used wedding photography and motocross. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Like, I probably I, stole that from you, I, honestly. No, it's no. such a good analogy though. Yeah, it's like how, it. Yeah, yeah. literally how are you gonna go from shooting one thing to the other and that transition in anybody's career. And again, we're talking about photography here because it's with, with yeah. you, Chris Burkhardt, but it's, literally any creative yeah. endeavor. Oh like it gosh. doesn't matter, you go from- Filmmaking, book writing. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah, between any of those things, even different segments within design from illustration mm -hmm. to graphic yeah. design or whatever. And it's so like, that is another th one of those truths that you really only know if you've lived it. And the, you know, the way I think about it is like, you have to actually take the action because all of the thinking about it in the world is not gonna get you anywhere. If you right. you said no one is gonna hire a photographer based on you thinking that you could do it if you had all the right yeah, shit. putting good energy out in the world. <laughs> yeah, right. And even having the equipment, that's like yeah. such a small part of it. Yeah. I think nowadays, you know, back when I think you and I were, were starting out, you know, and I can only imagine like, you know, you had like 10 years on me almost doing this. You've been doing this forever. like renting gear was not even a thing, you no. know? Nowadays, it's so easy. Like, yeah. you could be like, oh, cool, I'm gonna do this shoot. I'm gonna rent the gear. I'm gonna reach on, reach out online to somebody who has X vehicle or is a pilot or, or is a model or whatever, and, and you could connect the dots, like, yeah. so easily. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that, like, taking advantage of those things, you know, you For can, sure. geez, you can watch Creative Live class and you can learn all about it. Like, right. I think that that trial by fire was a big part of, I think, my career, and I think I've just always been too thick-headed to realize that like, you know, I've had to learn things the hard way. But one of the things I've really tried to empower um, up and comers or whatnot to do, and I think that one thing that we, you and I share a lot is like, I find, I don't know about you, and I'm just speaking for you here, but no, I'll we, take it. we find yeah. incredible joy in seeing the next generation mm. find success. And uh, I'm, I'm totally just skipping my last thought here, but I, I just wanna touch on this really yeah. quickly because it wasn't long ago 
10, 12 years ago where the most successful photographer was the one who made themselves maybe the least attainable. You know, the more detached you are, the more sort of elusive and secretive you are about your, your, your time and talents and, and how you invest in this and that makes you sort of this, um, I don't know, this snow leopard in some way. <laughs> yeah. And I think over the last 10 years, and this is a text that I've absolutely taken from you and realized is like, it's actually been totally the opposite. The photographers that are, and creatives, and, and I'm using the word photographer. Yeah, no, that's good. It's, director, it's or whatever, yeah. who are the most valuable in this day and age are the people who seem to make themselves the most available and willing to share concepts and ideas and, um, and industry secrets and this and that. And I think that that's something that I pride myself on. And I think obviously the proof is in the pudding. It's why you made what yeah, you made. Yeah, and sure. I just, I remember seeing that early on is watching, and I, you got shit for it too. You've yeah. talked oh, about sure. this. Like, yeah, yeah like I remember some of the first like blog posts and videos and like sharing about like your process and how, you, and I was just, I always, I feel like nowadays specifically that like the fact that that's available to people, yeah. like, please don't take it for granted. Right, people, it's like a digital it's so, camera. You can learn so fast now with the digital camera because oh you take God. a picture and then you get the result versus having to take a picture on a film camera, write yeah. down all the settings. The notes, the this. The yeah, that. for when, and then develop your film, you know, one, yeah. three, five, ten days later. Right, right. And then realize that you blew it. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I know you know those days, slide film way back in the... Yeah. But uh, that, that action over intellect, that actually taking steps and... The, the community aspect of it. And there's a whole section of, of creative calling where it's basically, it's about community. And, and I think it's the most misunderstood aspect of forging a career. Yeah, yeah. Um, both cultivating it when there isn't community and participating in it when there is. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been also, you know, re reflect back to you now, it's been very, very inspirational to see, even on this book tour, like the community that you've built mm -hmm. driving um, yeah, yeah. up the coast and having you know totally blown out shows in these in in these you know climbing stores and outdoor yeah, adventure yeah. places and tonight you're at mirror in seattle and you were in portland yeah you know like that has a massive sense of community like you can tap right. into a little bit of chris if you come to this climbing store right. in boulder right. colorado right and i and i just love the fact that when people like i just never take it for granted that's just the reality. Like I just, when people come and they see me, they're gonna get 100%. I don't care if they wanna talk about, you know, my alpacas being pregnant or what it was like to be stuck in a jail cell in Russia or whatever. Like I, I'll talk yeah. about anything, I don't yeah. care. And I think that that willingness to be open is, is to be honest, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's what the world needs more of. It's storytelling. And if you are not, like how can you call yourself a storyteller if you're not willing to tell your own story in an honest way? And for many years, I struggled with that and I'm sure as many of us have, rightly so, it's really challenging. I, it, it shouldn't be easy. Like my ability to be open and transparent is a, a learned skill that I've had to introspect and come to terms with. And I'm still not totally there. Like, and that's okay. You don't have to have it all figured out. I don't, like I don't know what the next five years will be. I don't know what the next project is. Kind of do, but um, but I don't know what the next thing is and if, yeah. or what the next portfolio I want to invest in is. Yeah. Um, but I, but I, I have learned to just find joy in the process of not having it all figured out because I was very much in the beginning of my career, like what's five years out, what's 10 years out, you know, and then you're there and you're like, you know, I kind of enjoy what I'm doing right this second. Like I, I love this. Yeah. You don't and have I, to see the whole staircase. You just need <laughs> to see a, a couple steps. No. Right? And I, yeah. yeah. It's just like, there's something to be said for just enjoying this. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So. so. Speaking of storytelling, like I can't just let you gloss over being in a jail cell in Russia. Yeah, I was in a jail cell in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> How did that happen? I mean, the full, that's one of the fun ones to write about in the memoir. Because, <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, and it, but I mean, yeah, it's a really simple story. Um, uh, but it requires a tiny bit of back mm -hmm, story. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and basically, yeah, you know, I, I was at a point in my career when I was like, I was just, ready and raring. I had figured out and realized that warm tropical places weren't doing it for me. And, you know, they were ripe with Wi-Fi and tourism and all this stuff that I just felt like was sucking the adventure out of the, the photographs. And I also kind of felt like I was being used, my creativity to like sell these places that were supposed to feel remote and wild and they were high rise hotels. And that's kind of the backstory. I, I started going to colder places like Iceland, Norway, Faroes, Alaska, whatever. 
um, Russia because well, very I, cold places. Yeah, well, because they were further from the equator, yeah. they were more remote. The the chance of finding new and wild surf was was exciting, and um, we settled on this place called Vladivostok, and we had found a contact who was like who knew a lot about it and wanted to invite us out, and um, and. It was inside the Sea of Japan. It gets wind swell fairly frequently. And we, we planned it all out. And point here is that basically I produced the trip um, and I dealt with all the visas and for everybody, for the writer, for the surfers, for myself. And every single one of them goes through this um, you know, visa process or the customs office right there, you know, mm-hmm. getting their passport stamped and this you know, tall blonde Russian lady is like staring at everybody, boom, and she gets to me and I look at her and she looks at me and I look at her and I immediately realize there is not, a, something is not clicking here. And she calls over comrade and, and then he, you know, points at this and I look at my visa and I realize the entry date is two days off. And I'm just like, oh my God. <laughs> like, I'm like, no big deal. I'm already here, whatever. That turned into a six hour interrogation my fixer Olga basically came over and was trying to help him and I could just see the the sort of the the joy and the the her the blood leaving her face and the when she had to tell me you're going to have to stay overnight in a jail cell because the last flight to Korea just left and you're going to be deported in 24 hours and I was like Okay, so I got walked from the airport, hand in hand, Russian guards, put into a holding cell. This wasn't like a jail, not in a prison, right? Yeah. Um, it was like a, basically an a airport jail. It's off the premises across, and I walk into this building, thrown into this room, bars in the windows, the door has no handle on it. <laughs> um, there's a little bed right there, and I'm just wow. there with my stuff. And Long story short, because um, it's we an read amazing the book. story, and I want you to read the book eventually, <laughs> but ultimately, um, I, like, I tried to leave all of my, <laughs> I, you know, I've watched a lot of 007 in my day, and um, I tried to leave all my sort of, you know, <laughs> all the things I thought about Russia at the door, but when the guard opened my door and his name was Igor, and he had one eye, and I was just like, I was just like, somebody's got to be playing a prank on me. Right, I was looking sorry. around for Ashton Kutcher, like you're punk. I'm sorry, I was like, yeah. and, and I almost got out of the jail because of, they weren't treating me, treating me cruel or unusually at all, but we were t- I was talking to the U.S. Embassy. I called my wife. I had my phone with me. I'm like telling her what's going on. And she's stressed out. My parents are stressed out. And you can imagine I'm 22, right. 3, and newly married. And Halfway across the world. And now yeah. I'm like having these feelings like I let my family down. I let my mom down. You know, how could I be so untrustworthy? And um, basically... I was gonna get out because they weren't gonna feed me, and they eventually fed me. One a.m., they dropped, they walked me down to this like steel tables, and, and underneath this thing, and I it, like, I was like, "What's about to go down?" Like, yeah. One a.m., they get a knock on the door. It's it's Igor. He's like, you know, telling me to come with me. <laughs> I will tell you one thing. <laughs> the absolute best part of this experience, you know, when you're young and like, there's people in your life who are like, "Oh, I've been there," and your mom's like, "Oh, well, so and so has been there. You should talk to her." And like, yeah. they like, you know. <laughs> Like in had your, a foreign exchange student from totally. Russia. They never actually went to Russia. Yeah. So this gal, Heather Harris, I'll never forget her name. She's like, oh, Chris, you know, there's only three important things you need to know. One of them is this, you know, hello, thank you. One of them is this, like how to use the bath, like where's the bathroom? And then one of them is like something else, I forget. And, and um, I'm like, okay, cool, thanks, Heather. And I remember <laughs> Igor opens the door and, uh, and the the bathroom, Igor. You like you can't make this up. No, no, I, I you can't make this up. I G O R, and I was just like, I like saw it, and I was like, oh my god, like. <laughs> and so, life. the bathroom in this little cell thing was like leaking, like water was leaking out of the floor. It was like you, you didn't even want to touch it because it was like you have like hover over the toilet. Igor opens the door, and I wasn't aware that he was about to bring me to get some food. I'm just thinking, oh, this is the end, or what's going to happen? They're going to take my phone, or they knew I was calling the embassy. He eventually did take my phone, but. <laughs> in some random attempt to like speak Russian like this was the moment to do that to kind of like break the ice and like <laughs> I, I kind of told I was wanted to tell him like I need to use the bathroom because this didn't work and I repeated what I had thought was I need to use the bathroom which is uh, I'm going to bl- butcher this but it was like kochu klizmu and um, he looked at me with a look that I have never seen on a man's face before <laughs> and it turned out that Heather 
had played a practical joke on me and what she told me was, I need to use the bathroom, was I need an enema now. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm sitting here with Igor and he looks at me and I'm like, I'm like, I realize in that moment, I'm like, I just Shh. asked for the wrong thing. I just asked for the wrong thing. And I'm all of a sudden like, like change the subject. I'm like, oh yeah, let's, let's go, let's go, let's go. Yeah, no, no, Eat, food sounds good, you know, whatever. I'm like, take me wherever you want me, just do whatever you want with me. Just don't give me an enema. Because I think like I was bringing in all these cameras. This, Vladivostok yeah. is one of Russia's like main naval bases too. And um, it's where a lot of their warships go to basically be, you know, sit in the ocean. And um, so you're bringing in cameras and surfboards, you, you know, huge lenses like, yeah. You look like yeah, yeah. whatever, you know the deal. So, I do, yeah, I've um, also been held before. Yeah, so I get deported to Korea. All right, I go downstairs, I eat some weird soup, I have diarrhea the rest of the night. I get deported to Korea, I come back a day later. That's the story. <laughs> Point being, and I just I just wanna cap this with one quick thing. No, is this that, is beautiful. Because, there, because there's, a, there's a real message here, and this is a part of that introspection, this is a part of that storytelling, is that if you live stories, but you don't ever take the time to digest why they were important. There's a beautiful um, speaker, Pico Iyer, who, who wrote some amazing books, and I, I saw him at TED one time, and he always said, he's like, the real stories come to you when you're sitting at home and you're thinking through it. Because when I was in that cell, I was just pissed off. Yeah, I was pissed off at the embassy, I was pissed off at the lady, I was, all these things I was mad about, but the truth of the matter was, is there was no one to be upset about but me, yeah. but at me, because I, made the mistake, the, the dumb mistake of not looking over my visa. And I was so bullheaded and just focused on what I wanted that I didn't take the time to respect these places that I was going to, to take the time to do the proper research, take the time to even you know double check my visa. And so when I got home, I really had the realization, I'm like, you know, that thing they say about traveling is true. You wanna travel to be a better person, but the process of being a better person doesn't just automatically happen from buying a ticket, going there, coming back. You know, if you start up Everest and asshole, you're gonna come down the same way. Yeah. It starts before you leave your front door. The process of becoming a better person starts before you leave your front door. The act of sitting on a plane, burning carbon and going somewhere and taking pictures does not make you better. And so I really had to realize that I need to pay more respect to these places. I need to consider why I'm going there. I need to, you know, just be doing my due diligence as a storyteller. So Again, long-winded answer. Beautiful, no, but, no. Yeah, but that's, that's the reality. That's the, what, so that is a great door that I have to walk through. Like, what is your why? You my talk, why? Yeah, you talk Shoot. to yourself about a, as a storyteller, which you are uh, on a world-class level uh, in many different media, but why do you wake up and do this every day? I think it's changed. Over the years, you know, it, it, there was a time when it was more simple. It was like, I want to inspire people to travel and see the world because traveling is what has made me who I am today. And I, I absolutely feel like I would be a worse person if I didn't have that. It was my education. It was yeah. my my first love. It was my, my outlet. It was the, the thing that I would go to during hard times. I would even use it as an escape, as a drug. I think understanding new cultures and people and filtering it through my lens was a huge part of that. But that's still very true, but it's changed. And I think the beauty of a mission statement is that it can change. Yeah. Um, and I think the one beautiful thing about mission statements is if you don't know what that client magazine boss um, his mission statement is, you will never work for them. Like I've always told students, I'm like, I, I, I sit in these classrooms and I'm like, if you wanna work for Nat Geo, raise your hand. Everybody raises their hand. What is their mission statement? Nobody can answer it. And I'm like, to inspire people to care about the planet. All of everything they do lives with under this umbrella. And if you don't understand that, or if you haven't done the time to do the research, like why would you wanna work for somebody you don't understand? And um, it's such a true thing. And I think for myself, I'm constantly re-asking myself that why. And nowadays I think it's evolved into um, something more personal. Like I really wanna tell stories that are often about issues that I have or struggles that I've dealt with um, through a lens that feels um, approachable, safe, and inspiring. And my newest project, which um, is a story about a friend of mine, Ellie Thor, he's a dad. Um, he's an Icelander who uh, basically, right around 20, had a near-death experience kayaking, got sucked behind a waterfall and almost died, hypothermic, blacked out, woke up a half mile down this river. And um, it's a story about him raising a daughter and dealing with risk 
and parenting and raising your kids in a way that inspires them to be live the biggest life that they can. And it's a story about something that I fear and think about every damn day. You know, and I think yeah. in many ways it's easier to tell a story through the perspective of somebody else than it is you. And yeah. um, so we just actually, that's a short film. It's going to be free. We just submitted it to Tribeca and it got accepted. It's going to premiere in Tribeca in wow, April. Wow, that's huge. Really stoked. Yeah, and it's like, I mean, I watch it. I fall my eyes out. It's that's like huge. So I'm, I'm, and this is a foray into a world I've never explored. And so I think that just like, just like, your work, my work, it changes, we evolve. Um, the things we care about evolve as you have kids and you, you deal with these internal issues and you wanna share those issues with the world. I think that um, I, I change that mission statement from time to time and I, I want it to grow with me, so. That's a brilliant answer. Yeah. Also, don't think that that is common knowledge. I think that people's, your North Star will change and evolve. And right. I've always looked at folks who had the same North Star is like, should I be more like that? Because that just seems so consistent. And then I, you go back to that thing and there was a time where I was like just doing commercial action sports photography. It's like, there are people I'm to my left and to my right, they've been doing this for 35 years. Right, and I'm right. like, wow, I need to do something different. Right. And that allowing yourself to change and grow and focus on new things is actually part of the, to me, that's part of the magic. Oh, totally. You know? And I and I, one, one thing I wanna say about that too, because I, I see that a lot within the surf world that I was a part of is like, there's a lot of guys who are shooting this, um, they're, they're lifers, you know, they're, they're shooting yep. this for a career forever. And I, I wanna make sure that the world knows there's nothing wrong at with all. That. There's Zero. nothing wrong with Not like, a... you're on the sidelines of the NBA and you're shooting and you've been doing it for 40 years, badass. Like yeah. you're a legend, like welcome. For sure, everybody in the whole universe knows your name. I yep. think the reality is like for you and I, and I think many of our circle of friends, whether it's like, you know, Corey or Renan or those people, um, Photography and or creative outlets, they've always kind of been that like, this is what I do to get out of my comfort zone and grow and learn. And so for a lot of people who are maybe doing that as lifers, like that's their career. And the things that they do to grow and learn and this, that, like, that could just be totally something yeah, else that you different. don't know about. Yeah, you know? for sure. Um, and that's rad. You know, you look at like, again, there's people I know who are like, they're a world-class climber, you know, and that's what they do to like push themselves and this and that. But you know, commercial work or, you know, being a DP, like that's just kind of the career path. And I think, I think it's more about what and how you, you sort of use those things. I think at times in my life, I've kind of shifted to being like, I'm just going to like fall back on this as the career thing and like just go through the motions. But on the side, I'm doing something else. I did like a, you know, six years ago, my wife convinced me to do a yoga teacher training, which I was like, this is ridiculous because I don't ever want to teach yoga. But I, that was something that helped me access a deeper part of myself. So yeah. that during that period of time, that sufficed. You know, having kids um, for people during a period of time, that can suffice as that yeah, crazy that thing. growth thing. Yeah. It's just a matter of not losing it, you know, and in whatever capacity it serves you, so. So you've already given us a couple of hints with respect to what's next. Yeah, you yeah. got a, a memoir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Short clearly, film thing, The, yeah. the film <laughs> yeah. in Tribeca, that's huge. I'm excited, I really wanna send you um, a screen or two to like check it out, because it, be, it would be really fun to get your take. Oh, I'd so. give a limb. Yeah. Like, you're not leaving here now that I know that that's possible. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, pull the spark plug out your van <laughs> yeah, exactly. as it's sitting out back. Um, but th so those are, are huge things. What about um, within the world of photography? Yeah, you know, within the world of photography, um, I don't really have anything that I'm like. You know, if if I'm being honest, there's a lot of times where I feel. Um, I get a little sad, you know, I see like a lot of these like action sports photo contests and I'm like, damn, you know, I haven't shot anything that sick in a while. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, I I did this amazing, amazing, incredible, you know, job for this Fortune 500 fruit company, if you know what I'm talking about, but nobody's ever gonna see that or know that my name was on it. For sure. So that's like a little, it's a little challenging, you know, at times to be like, you know, I mean, it's ego. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm just, transparent like this is yeah, ego and I for sure you know you you've seen your photos in the cover of magazines and you know that pays you a thousand bucks and you just made ten thousand dollars a day or twenty but there's some part of you there's some deep part of you that's right. like no one's ever gonna know that was that, nobody yeah, cares sure. like nobody cares that you shot the right. the campaign for the you know the, the Amazon this and the mic you know or the, the Toyota it's just yeah. like it's hard because um I Again, like with the personal projects, I look forward to like 
kind of having one harebrained idea that 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 I bring to life every couple yeah. of years, and I think yeah. you do too. And that's a that's a challenge, you know. I, I I get sad a little bit. I flip through the magazines, I don't see um, I don't see my name there uh, yeah. a lot, and or I I you know look at these contests, and I don't. But so every couple of years, I I in addition to kind of a personal project or whatever. I try to do something that's like back to kind of my roots or my core. I just got back from a trip to the Aleutian Islands uh, about two weeks ago. That was a place that when I went there originally, um, six years ago, it changed my career. It was this beautiful volcano and the surfer and talk about the ends of the earth searching for perfect waves, which to be honest, a work like this, like advocating for Iceland's environmental you know, spaces is way, way better and, and something way more honest and real and, and actionable, but the ego part of me wants to like still yeah. have a little thread yeah. in the surf world or, or in the climbing world or in the ski world. And I, yeah. I feel like for you, there's, there's gotta be some part of oh, that. Oh, you're like the same thing. There's yeah. a ton of ego around that when you decide to like, and for my lens was like trying to fry ultimately a way bigger yeah. fish in terms of potential impact and opportunity yeah. and certainly interest for me when you, that's, you know, re- reference that earlier point I made about, you know, flying a hundred people into the New, New Zealand, you have yeah. like literally, there's a schedule for helicopters moving back and forth between locations. This is the penultimate. There's no, yeah. you know, there's no higher, better yeah. place to go on your career path. And then you're already thinking about the next thing. And yeah. that that's part of, to me, this, whether it's growth or change or whatever it is that we're managing, I love that you couched it in ego because there was a huge, you know, probably a window of five years where that was like that heartstrings. Like you used to walking by any magazine rack and seeing five of your images on the yeah. on the on the fronts of those magazines. Yeah, yeah, it's it, such an ego trip. It is, and, yeah. and I, I mean, and I'm sure you have a bit of this too. Like you know, you shoot at Stevens Pass a lot, right? That was like, oh yeah, that, that was, was my your, OG. That was your, I grew that up was your thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you think like there's days where you'll be like, oh man. It's like a fresh pow day. They just had two feet of fresh on the mountain. Like that used to be like, I'm packing up, I'm going, I'll be there the night before, Bob. That was your life. For sure. And now you're like, well, I've got this conference call and I got this meeting. And like, it's the same thing for me. It's like for me to go to the beach sometimes, like not only do I have to clear my schedule, I have to pay my my (laughs) office manager to clear my schedule. And then that puts all those people out. And I'm like kind of burdening all those relationships and then blah, blah, blah. And I just, for me just to go like, you know, go to the beach and take a couple pictures. And like, that sounds so untrivial, but it's like, there's a part of that that I need that calls yeah. me. There's a part of that that like I don't. And I, I, I there's that struggle in there. And yeah. I'm sure for you, it's like awesome. a similar thing. You're, you know, in Seattle sitting here. Like, I am not a tech CEO by any classic, <clears throat> like, right. you know, just look at me or no. like listen you to like me. You like to have fun. Yeah, there's that. this very weird. And when I'm in those environments, why I may have, done those things like I don't those are not my people they're not bad people they're just not the people that I'm like aligned with emotionally Mm -hmm. spiritually from a values perspective and so continuing to and I also had a certain amount of pride and I can recognize this in you and being able to you know step outside of the mold of what are you what you think a fill in the blank is um it's really inspirational to hear about your Tribeca project. That's Thanks, man. so, so, so cool. And while these are juxt- they're, they're adjacent, like that's a whole nother world too. We watched our friend Jimmy yeah. do it with Free Solo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, that is just an, an epic well, outcome. Well, and I think it's a byproduct of, of seeing all these people making great work that still, um, it speaks to their core, yeah. who they are, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Meru, Free Solo, whatnot. A lot of, all, all Renan's films too, you know, and this and that. And, um, and, and Corey's book too, mm-hmm. his, his new book thing, um, which is amazing. And I, I think for me, <clears throat> what I've realized is that there's growth I need, which is the advancement of storytelling in more deep and meaningful ways. There's growth I need internally, which is like, I need to get some things off my chest and, and I need to address something that I fear and think about every day um, and put it into a good story. And then also this is a healing thing for my friend. My, yeah. One of my best friends, yeah. Ellie, which uh, he, um, when we shot this film, we went back to the waterfall. He hadn't been there in, he hadn't been there in 12 years. Oof. And we're sitting there, we're filming this and it's all very real. Like we're there, he's staring at this thing and he's like, you know, I, I got sucked under here, you know, and I got washed out through here and he's looking through this river and there's just like, you know, you can see the emotion in his eyes. And I'm like, 
this is why you do this because it's healing for him, it's healing for me. Like somebody's gonna watch that, they're gonna care deeply, they're gonna understand. You know, he's got this incredible daughter who he's like given up so much for to, to raise and raise well and, and make sacrifices so she can have an amazing, and I'm just like, this is what the world needs. And he's a surfer. And so there's still this, this slight connection to this core audience yeah. because to me, it's this access point. Like I, I'm, this, for is for every, sure. this is for everybody, but how much cooler can it be when, when you know there's a core audience that, that you're a part of, like growing up, being a surfer, being at the beach or whatnot, and being able to give that kind of gift to them to be like, hey guys, or gals, or moms, or dads, or anybody out there, like he's still doing what he loves. Yeah. Despite these fears, Despite these responsibilities, he's made making it happen while making these sacrifices, and that's kind of it. And I think that, again, um, you know, the the thing about it is like it's it doesn't matter if people know the whole ending or the crescendo or whatever. Right. It's it's more about the visuals and yeah. how it was created. Um, but I just hope to do more of that in the end. And I think that, you know, as you work on more films and projects, you kind of like, oh well, people need to care about the character. Yeah. And character development is so huge, and huge. I I really aspire to um, to create meaningful characters. And, and that's just like a huge part of it, but yeah. Well, you have done that yeah. feel like in spades over your career and this new area of opportunity and expression mm -hmm. and uh, A, congratulations, super excited. And B, dude. in case you are uh, curious at all, it's at Glacier's End, available only at your... Yeah, right now. We'll right. probably find distribution yeah. uh, early next year, but right now it's all available through our shop. And they're, So cool. Yeah, it's the best selling book I've ever worked on. It's been amazing, and I'm really humbled to put it out. So. And then uh, coordinates on the internet. You're at Chris Burkhardt and Instagram. Millions of yeah. followers. Where else? What's the best place to... Um, those are them, you know? Just a Google search and some stuff pops up. And uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a film I made, Under Arctic Sky, that's a really fun project about, you know, trying to do hard things with your friends, learning from them, <laughs> you know, like everything. And yeah, um, yeah I guess uh, if you want to really know more about my story and um, look for my memoir, it's going to be called The Hard Way Home, and it's going to be out in 2021, I believe, through Abrams. Wow. So. How's the project going so far? <laughs> no comment. Never really? cried more in my life. <laughs> no comment there. We know how hard that is. Uh, you also have a class on Creative Live for anyone yeah. who's interested. Do, it's yeah. an amazing uh, outdoor a class I need to update because I feel like a lot of things have changed. So I need to I need to talk All right. to the team about that. Done. We'll, yeah. we'll figure that out as a part yeah. of our uh, post interview conversation here. Thanks all for tuning in. Yeah. Uh, at wherever you are in your car, running uh, in your commute, sitting at your desk, just a round of applause from the man here, Mr. Chris Burkhardt. Thanks, Thanks for so being on the show, bud. Yeah. Appreciate you, You're the man. Uh, yeah. Bye, everybody. See you tomorrow. Awesome.